good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the draft um, that we received of the recommendations for the uh, West Palm Beach downtown parking study. Um, let me put this in context, uh, and we've shown this slide many times. I won't dwell on it, but you know this is part of the greater mobility plan and mobility fee study that we're undertaking, and this is an important component part of it, along with the Gale Public Life Study. We're doing a citywide um, bicycle master plan and um, the Okeechobee Boulevard quarter study, as, as you'll recall. Um, these are all component parts of it, and this is a really important part of that overall study. Um, and, and so I'll go over some of the goals that we looked at when we started this parking study. Um, we want to try, and, I, and I'm going to go in more detail, we want to redistribute the parking demand throughout the downtown. It's imbalanced, and I'm going to show you numbers on that. Um, we want to create more options for people to park. Um, and most importantly, one of the most important parts of this is we want to manage the curb more efficiently. And particularly in light of what the future holds, you know, we're looking at the future of autonomous vehicles and Uber and Lyft and all these um, changes that are going to be in the way that, um, that people get around um, using uh, automobiles or vans. And so we want to manage the drop-offs. We also want to look at because uh, at freight loading and unloading, uh, which has become very important. And I think everyone sees that this is just increasing, particularly in our downtown area. And of course, we want to reduce cruising. We want to be able to make it easy for people to find a place to park, make it convenient to find a place to park, and hopefully have people park once and not be moving their vehicle and hopefully not cruising around the block trying to find a, find a spot because that just creates congestion it's and funny uses resources. You know, when you guys talked about that before, I, I, like, I didn't realize that a lot of people were doing that, that were doing cruising a lot, looking for a parking spot. And it can Apparently be as much as 20 percent. Frequently. Yeah, it can be as much as 20 percent of the traffic in the downtown area is due wow. to cruising. So what if we could improve that, it would be dramatic. So, um, And of course we want to do smart policies and that's what you're going to see that are going to is going to come out of this where we see some really uh, smart policy recommendations in regard to parking demand management which then would impact the overall mobility study. And, and it, most importantly we want to enhance the experience for for people that work downtown, that live downtown, that visit downtown we want them to have a good experience in regard to parking. So you're going to see some operational recommendations, some other things here that we think um, will, will improve uh, their experience. Uh, we did a bunch of data collection and you can see based on um, the colors, red is, is bad because that means that we're almost fully utilizing the uh, parking availability um, in those segments that are red, and this is in garage and on street. Um, and there's some other statistics here, but I think the takeaway, most important takeaway, um, is that the city only controls 18% of the parking downtown. And I, th and, I, and I don't think people realize that, that 82% is controlled by private interests. Um, and that the other thing is, is I don't think people realize a real imbalance downtown from garage to garage. I mean, if you take a look at Avernia, it's 99% utilized um, versus other garages that are far less utilized, like Clematis Garage. So there's an imbalance in the downtown, and so we're not effectively using the capacity of what we have out there. Excuse me, Mr. Kelly. Commissioner Ryan? Thank you. When you say 82% private, does that take out, like, the courthouse and um, county government, or are those included, or just excluded sorry. completely from the study? This is all other, and so I shouldn't have said city. Okay. I mean, I shouldn't have said um, government. You I should have said private. city. Gotcha. City so parking. So the eighty-two percent includes government and yeah. private. Yeah, all other parking is except for what city administration um, controls. So, thank you for correcting that. Um, Okay, so we did a survey of what motivates parkers, and um, there's three, they classified them in three different ways, uh, convenience parkers, reasonable parkers, and budget parkers. Um, and, and this is pretty common sense, it's intuitive. Um, 
that first time and frequent visitors that just want to come down maybe do some short-term shopping or whatever they stay for short periods of time and then you got mid and long-term parkers and you know em employees or residents um, have been shown that they're willing to uh, maybe go uh, further away to park because they're parking for longer periods of time and, and want to avoid um, high fees so um, that's basically what we're looking at right now in in regard to um, the areas uh, and we define those areas where these uh, where these air uh, convenience parkers versus budget parkers uh, frequent frequent um, key recommendations off-street parking um, one of the recommendations is reduce res residential parking permits now you know that could be controversial because um, a lot of the residential buildings that don't have extensive parking within their building um, the residents park typically in our garages what we're trying to do is incentivize them maybe to park in a different garage that would be further away or in a different location so that we can free up the garages and the you know core downtown for um, you know for our visitors and guests and people that are conducting business um, so yeah. um, the second one is explore um, Reserve. Go on. Commissioner yes. Ryan has another question. Sure. Thank you. So <clears throat> I just want to kind of get the lay of the land. When you look at the current residential parking users, they're using, it, they're obviously parking in garages closest to their location. Um, we have a lot of vacant parcels in the core and around the um, th these existing residential parking permit users so when you look at exploring alter, you know, either moving them further away do you also have a sense from mr. Green's um, building department as to what's coming in and what might be available and then see if we couldn't create more opportunities down the road as you do this versus yeah. we're talking more here. about shared parking yeah. when people come in to talk to us um, so yes yes yeah. we're the answer is yes we're look as the mayor said we're looking at shared parking arrangements um, but we're also looking at better utilization of the existing parking in the private garages um, like for instance I live in the Strand uh, at any given time 70 only 70 to 80 percent of the spots are occupied um, people that live in my condo actually rent space for a second vehicle in the city garage could we encourage you know like for instance the strand to accommodate uh, second spots for you know by by promoting it or or making arrangements with um, people that own spots that aren't utilizing them so this type of arrangements and this is part of the discussion of how do we encourage shared parking and how do we encourage better utilization of the, of the parking that we have um, the next one is explore reserve parking rates um, this has been asked for by the businesses um, that there could be prime spots it's been done in other communities this is a little bit different to where we're saying hey could we reserve a spot somebody would may pay more for that it might be a prime spot but it would promote businesses we hear from the class A office business sector that they need space and they need it convenient and that sort of thing so could this be something that we could um, put in place that could benefit the business community um, here's one that sounds easy but it's really hard is to try to find a place to move uh, two floors of evidence vehicle storage that's in the police PD garage um, on Sapadilla um, that garage um, we're using a you know a large percentage of that garage to store vehicles it doesn't seem like a very effective use so that's something we're going to concentrate on is trying to get those cars out of there they have to keep and for those that don't understand that we have to keep uh, vehicles and evidence for the life of the term of 
of the of the people that are incarcerated in case there's an appeal. So if it, if a car was used in a crime, that has to be that has to be say, that evidence has to be preserved for the life of their term of their serving, which is could be 30 years. <laughs> so you know there's quite a few vehicles then that we have to to be able to take care of. So and then. Most importantly, we want to increase availability for visitors, and we want to make it, an, again, I, I can't emphasize enough, we are really working to make it a more enjoyable experience for our visitors. We don't want visitors going away from here frustrated. Uh, you'll see some policies that we're going to suggest that are going to make it easier for visitors to park and make it uh, more attractive. So, so Scott, uh, we're, we're not suggesting, or this study is indicating that we have too little parking. We just have to better utilize the parking we have? That's correct. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up because within the city system, we're only utilizing 62% overall of the capacity that we have. Oh, really? Yes. And so that's well within guidelines that, you know, we have sufficient parking today. Of course, we have to start planning for the future, but today we have sufficient parking. Well, it's maybe just where it's distributed. We, so Maybe in the future we won't need all that parking. Well, and that's what we're hoping as as we adapt and that's some of the policies that we can put in place to reduce um, the need for parking as well as we have to start thinking about do we really want to build a lot more parking uh, in the future because of the fact that no. um, things are going to be different. Okay. So. Can I just go ahead. Thank you. I just can't. <clears throat> we must not be the only municipality that deals with this evidence garage storage vehicles I mean you've got the county you've got other municipalities that have their own police yeah. sound like a business opportunity I mean that's it a does lot sound of like it it does sound like a business opportunity <laughs> the um, county's going to be storing those vehicles out um, and I think it's going to be near Bell Glade they're creating a yard we asked if we could share that yard even though it's expensive to get them out there and back but you don't use them very often you know you don't have to pull them in and out very often and they don't have any availability there so we're looking for off-site less expensive real estate this is the most expensive real estate you could store you know evidence in obviously so so we're looking for opportunities um, so one of the things that was definitely brought forward was we need to do demand pricing, and this is what municipalities are going to, municipal governments are going to demand pricing, which means that um, the pricing will vary across uh, the system, and it will be based on what the demand for that space is. And this does uh, several things. Most importantly, it means that we will be able to free up spaces in some of the most desirable areas for visitors to come and they won't have to cruise if they want to come and do convenient shopping there'll be spaces available for them and our surveys indicate that they're willing to pay for that um, they want the convenience and so we need to be able to free up a percentage of our spaces in the most um, in the downtown area for those convenience for those people that want convenience and these are typically visitors or people that just want to come down and shop and what this means is that um, there's a benefit to our businesses and it's I think it's counterintuitive to sometimes but actually if you do this and you charge effectively for parking and you spread the demand out there's less congestion but there's also um, that improved business and and this was recognized <coughs> by Delray because they went to free parking and guess what they're going to demand parking now they discovered so that it was causing them cons real concerns and so everyone agreed down most of the people down there agreed that they should go to this demand based pricing so um, we're going to have to do a lot of work with the people the, the business owners and merchants on the street because I don't think they get this yeah and and you know there's a lot of things that we there's a lot of outreach that has to be done we've already been um, to the downtown merchants three times uh, with meetings and we've also been to uh, the the agencies that have the most parking demand which is um, uh, Palm Beach Atlantic uh, the county and related um, you know the areas related controls so those are the ones that are the highest demand so we've met with them independently we've also met 
with the Chamber of Commerce um, and, and we need to have a lot more outreach because there's some misunderstandings about I believe and you know um, there can always be disagreement but I think we need to do better education we're not doing good enough well enough in communicating let me give you a couple for instance um, Paul Beach Atlantic immediately when we started talking about hey there's a recommendation that we charge for on-street parking they immediately said no this is going to be very damaging to their college well you know Ed Davis who's our parking administrator couldn't be here today but he managed a large university parking system and he knows he knows how to manage that and so we're going to have them meeting with Ed to talk about what the advantages are of metering on street parking there's a huge advantage for them for the for uh, Palm Beach Atlantic um, and to price their parking accordingly because they have different prices for surface lots and their garages and whatever and let's park let's price all this accordingly to make it uh, the best experience for their students and for visitors and that sort of things yes I'm uh, sorry. Commissioner Material. Thank you. Commissioner. So I think it would be important for the Commission to also have this meeting with uh, with Ed. Um, and I know the Florida Atlantic and University of Florida, you know, they have um, parking um, stickers that they sell to their students and they have specific places that they can use them. And they have um, you know the the tickets that you get for parking in a spot without a sticker or for longer than you're supposed to are pretty substantial but it still frees up the ability for those students to be able to know that this is the area where we can park I'm not sure I agree with the um, metered parker parking in all areas of the city and I think Palm Beach Atlantic brings in enough people that spend money in the city that we have to have that conversation as well so when um, he is available. I'd like to know if he's already managed a large university campus style and we're a downtown campus It's a little bit unusual. I'd like to hear from him specifically What he plans to do in order to do metered parking and I know it's a little bit more convenient now because you can pay your meter from your phone um, But I I like to explore all the options and and understand what he's done in the past well, we will, he will be working with Palm Beach Atlantic and we'll let him proceed with that and then come back to you after they've straightened Well, that's it. what I'm saying. I'd like to hear from him exactly what's and it's a these are policy decisions. So I'd like to hear what he's suggesting so that we get it right. Well, I'm not really sure the policy decisions, but let's well, let him work that out with Palm Beach Atlantic. Um, another thing uh, is that we've discussed extending the hours of parking enforcement um, in the downtown area right now in city place you know it's extended to I believe it's 11 but in um, in the downtown area parking is at 7 o'clock it terminates there's a lot of good reasons to extend that but we've been listening okay and like for instance uh, some of the merchants said hey there's some real good reasons maybe not to extend it to 11 or 12 could we talk about um, you know I don't think they're objecting to extending it but not all the way to 11 and one of the ones was we don't want people getting in their car that have been drinking um, and trying to move their car because they're worried you know mm -hmm. about whether the meters gonna run out yeah. and that sort of thing so we understand all that and plus the other factor is some people leave their cars curbside uh, because they've had you know too much too much to drink and so you know you don't want to encourage those people to to be driving so these are things that we're listening you know and and if there's things that we can do um, to, we don't want to to have, have adverse impacts by some of the changes that we're doing so we're listening and and uh, we think it's a real need to extend it because um, of the parking beyond seven because what we're seeing is at seven o'clock all the employees go out move their cars to the curb and they're taking away from our visitors availability so you know there's pluses and minuses things and you know we'll work through these obviously we, uh, Commissioner Ryan's next Commissioner Ryan thank you so you know when I read the the, the study there's obviously a, a bunch of different recommendations related to different areas of, of, of goals and objectives so it seems to me that as you continue to go through this probably the first thing you do is is um, the signage 
right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't want yeah. people to park, but you have alternative parking for them, so it's that whole education that occurs before any of the changes go into place, I would assume. Yeah, and that's a really big piece, yeah. signage, because people don't know where the parking, right. and ultimately if we get to the point where we can actually have um, uh, people can get on an app and find out where parking is available. I know we're working on that. Um, and they'll be able to know where to go, where to find parking. And uh, I mean, as, as people go to restaurants, right, they know how to get to the restaurant. And what you want to do is be able, when they get there, instead of looking for their typical take a place on the street, but to look up and see that, hey, there's just there's parking just right around the corner there. Yeah. And if I were to to do that, I'll save you know worry, time, and 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 money. So I hope to, I hope that that's one of the big yep. and first things that we have is a robust parking sign. Well, I think it goes back to that technology piece too. Mm -hmm. You know, people know where parking spots are. Right. As they Absolutely. Educated. Those are both, those are all good points. So. Commissioner Material. Thank you. I, I always, um, I think it's always going to be a difficult conversation with business owners, whether they're retail or whether they're restaurants. Uh, everybody wants to know that their mm -hmm. clients can find them easily, park close by, come in, and they don't, what the last thing they want to hear is I, I tried to come by last Saturday, but I couldn't find a parking spot. Yeah. And one of the things you just said troubles me that their employees are moving. So employee parking and having employee um, sort of some way of identifying that it's an employee car, they should not be taking the prime spots. And that's a conversation that I hope that the city is going to engage in with the, um, the business owners. Yeah, we have talked with them about that a lot. Um, and, you know, I think there's still people that don't really got that. I think, you know, we all got an email from Morris at O'Shea's that, you know, don't raise parking rates and, you know, well, that's, and, that's, it, and it, you know, it's... It's not just downtown. No, and I know that we're not over. addressing just downtown. I know that there are employees. Restaurants use a lot of employees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when we're getting on the fringe of downtown, those restaurant employees, even though they're told not to, are parking on the residential streets. And it's frustrating to the residents, too. So there's some conversation about how to identify an employee car and it, and, and know that those businesses have a location for those em employees to park yeah. mm -hmm. is important. And it, the, you only have to explain it to them one time. Once they understand that that's what they have to do, um, we'll stop getting complaints mm -hmm. and there will be open um, spaces in our residential areas yeah. as well. Even behind, they're still doing it, even behind the convention center. Yeah, we drove through there the other day and yeah. there were lots of people parked. That yes. Um, it's and amazing, that, actually. Still, yeah. Um, and, but and uh, but a, and a big deal is workers, construction workers are parking. Like for instance, Palm Beach Atlantic. Yeah. Um, right. We get complaints because you got construction workers parking on the curb. Well, you know, this is part of what we're discussing is that hey, if we had if we had well, metered, it wouldn't you know they, they the wouldn't same. be parking there. So can we? But on the other hand, we got to provide. Parking reasonable point. parking accommodations for them and where will that be and so that's part of this discussion so. okay go ahead okay. Scott oh the last thing is misuse of on-street loading this has become a huge issue you know you see um, vehicles that are just blocking traffic um, they stop in the middle of a lane um, it's just really difficult at this point Makes me so crazy. <laughs> we've got to do a better job of regulating that and um, and providing uh, points on the curb for them to be able to unload. You just can't say, hey, uh, you just can't park there. They got to unload somewhere. So you've, we've got to look at where good, smart policies are on unloading. So. Go ahead, Paula. Thank you. Um, so just to follow up on the, the meetings that you have been having with the merchants, the last one that I was able to attend, Sean had said that they were going to reach out as a you know an organization or as a group to like Cheney Brothers and the Bush, mm -hmm. to, to all of the different deliveries, they're all similar trucks and try to coordinate timing. Is, is that moving forward? Are they able Yeah, to they've that? been working on that, but beyond that, we're looking at um, uh, ourselves contacting them to try to figure out um, what are other cities doing in regard to unloading, um, and can we provide curbside space for that unloading activity, and can we restrict the hours of that so it doesn't cause issues. So we're also doing that. Good. Um, just a minute, Scott. Before you get uh, any 
Further, Scott, can you explain to uh, us what is the rule about parking lots? You know, there's a lot of, there are some empty, uh, there's some empty land, and I know it's owned by private owners, but what's the rule for parking on those locations? Do they have to be paved in order to be a yes. parking lot? So the yes. only way to do it is just regular, is like create a parking lot, which is a pretty expensive endeavor. Well, and if it's not zoned properly, you can't just create a, a new parking lot, a surface lot. Um, in the downtown parking, area. It has to yeah. and and, and okay. mm -hmm. we're not saying that we need more parking lots yeah. downtown. We, we, we don't need utilize. more parking I'm thinking lots. about deliveries. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and we need to better utilize the space. And like, for instance, on you know, SunFest, uh, you know, we're, we get complaints because, but it's just a distribution of, those, of that parking. There's plenty of parking even during SunFest, the biggest events. And, and by the way, I don't know, um, you know, if I've mentioned this, but one of the big things is that we're also studied event parking and what we can do better t for event parking because we have people come down here, they get very frustrated because of the congestion. Well, because we they want to park right next to the event. Yeah. But if we can <laughs> provide, um, you know, some transit or whatever, that's what we're looking at is how better to manage these events um, effectively. Um, this next one, I'll try to move on. Um, Extend meter hours of enforcement, as I mentioned, I already went through that. Implement demand-based pricing. This is uh, on the Don Shoup theory that you want 15% of the spaces available for people to be able, so they don't have to cruise, so they can conveniently get to where they're trying to get to, um, and you want to price it accordingly. So that's uh, one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, improve utilization and review of our processes. And this also includes operationally. We want to make our garages more inviting, we hear stories that they seem like they're dark, um, maybe um, they don't feel safe that people utilize them. We think this is a perception because we don't see evidence that there's really a, a lot of criminal activity that are occurring, but it's a perception issue. But how do we end up um, you know, making sure that people feel safe um, in, our, in our garages? Um, event parking, as I brought forward, I won't talk too much more about this, but um, you know, some of the larger events, um, people all want to park in the Banyan Street garage and it becomes an incredibly congested. And so can we entice people to park in a lot that's further away and then provide some kind of um, transit options for them? And also just the organization of this, of these events to where uh, we get people out of the garages easier and faster. Um, we may, you know, switch uh, some of the roads to one way uh, during events, that, that sort of thing. You know, what can we do to make it more effective? I think that that's a great um, possibility for testing our autonomous 15 passenger van. Yes, <laughs> yeah. right? We can Absolutely. pick people up at the, yeah. at the a distant garage and bring them in. Absolutely. And um, so we're also going to also work with private facilities. Um, and hopefully we're going to all work together on a tiered parking rate structure, particularly for events, so that we would charge more in the downtown area. Right now we charge the same whether, wherever you're at. It could be $20 on some events, $5 on other events, but we charge throughout the same. Well, it doesn't make any sense. You're going to charge $20. Who, where are they going to go park if it's you know, flat across, um, all, all across the system. So we're looking at a rate structure that has the highest rates in the most convenient garages and less out in other areas. And we're going to work with the private net lots as well. Um, so uh, one of the things that came up was, um, which we think is a very important, and this is a very important policy objective, and we've been working with, with planning, and we've also brought this up to a number of the stakeholders. Um, a couple policy objectives. Number one is um, that we would migrate from parking minimums to parking maximums. Okay, so when I say parking minimums, right now the zoning code in the, requires that you have to build so many spaces for when you build a building. And what that does is it encourages um, more people to park. It's expensive, uh, for, particularly if you want affordable housing because they have to build the spaces um, for the parking whether they need it or not. So what we're looking at is encouraging people not to overbuild on parking but to do things such as shared parking or we 
we all work together to provide options for them. And when I say options, it's better transit, it's better um, locations. Um, as I mentioned, spread that demand out across the system. We have, we have some um, d um, capacity that we could utilize. So how do we effectively do that and create what we call parking maximum? Now, with that said, we also hear that certain types of businesses have to have parking and they want a higher level of parking. So what the proposal is, is that we would look at a soft and a hard maximum, the hard maximum being a lot higher than the soft maximum. For those that want to exceed the soft maximum, they would mitigate the impact. So if they're gonna provide more parking and create more congestion because of the parking, then they would help mitigate that impact of, of the additional parking that they need. So this wouldn't prevent people from having higher parking levels, but they would have to mitigate the impact. We think this is smart policy uh, moving forward. So. Mr. Materia? What, what does that mean, Scott? Mitigate pay more? They would provide, and as you can see here, here's a whole list of activities um, that's been suggested, or we could, they could pay into a fund, perhaps, where it would pay for transit or other options to reduce, offset their additional congestion they would pay into something so that we could provide higher levels of transit and we could reduce the congestion um, elsewhere. So, you know, you would offset it so that you wouldn't increase congestion um, within the city. So. Mayor, can we, can we get a copy of this? Because I, yeah. I don't think it's just it's, me. I it's can't always really difficult to read. <laughs> yeah. But if you could send us a copy of this yes. when you're done, that would be really helpful. No, we, we, we have sent a copy out. Um, and I'll send a copy of the presentation. And we also sent a copy of the draft plan yeah, out. Yeah, you have so. a copy of the study. But yeah. we'll get it to you again, so. Uh, the other thing I think is important is enforcement of parking rates. Um, we hear visitors, first time here, they get confused about where to park. You know, we don't want them to have a bad experience. So we're talking about changing our parking um, enforcement rates uh, so that if this is your first offense, you don't get charged much. You know, it's just uh, more of a warning type thing versus someone that has three and four um, occurrences, they should get charged higher because they're habitually um, not following the rules and creating issues for people. So that's what we're looking at is increasing uh, the fees for those that habitually abuse the system versus ones that you know, first offense, you shouldn't be charged a lot. We don't want, we don't want people to have a bad experience. Um, and out of this, as well, part Scott, of the- excuse me, yes. Trisha Muffin. Thanks, I can remember the parking um, administration uh, a few years ago when you got a first fine, uh, first parking ticket, when you, when you went in to pay it, they gave you about the same amount in parking, um, uh, like a parking card. It was it was really uh, very understanding and a nice way to do it. So I I, I, I don't know if you're going to look into that again. Well, and that's part of what we're talking about. We want to be um, viewed, perceived as being friendly and and helpful to people, not like we got you, you know, type thing. So we're we're looking at what policies we can put in place to 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 you know display a, a more a better perception of parking enforcement. Um, what I think is interesting is that these are a bunch of capital improvements that have been suggested that have come out of the mobility study that will also help with parking. Um, and um, like, I mean, something as simple as bike parking. Um, you know, uh, signage and wayfinding is what was brought up. That's probably one of the most important things we can do is better signage and wayfinding. And I won't go into all these, but there's a lot of things that we could do that could improve the parking experience and, uh, and make it easier for people to get around, so. And um, Good. that's it. So Thank you. Um, a couple other things real quick, because I have to go at 1130 to have a call, because I know you all have inquired about this, and we're going to have a call in regard to southbound flagger left-hand turn onto Okeechobee. Um, you know, it's been a long time um, that this has been studied. The we county were, asked to it study it. It was closed when they started working on yeah. the bridge, and mm -hmm. we were told it would be open when the bridge was done. And it's still not open. So we're having a conference call at 1130. So 
um, I may have to leave, so I, I wanted to let everyone know that. And, and therefore, um, there's another subject that I wanted just to uh, break the ice on, is that there's a project that's under consideration um, that would be um, uh, potentially funded by the CRA and the city, and it has to do with streetscape on, on Clematis. Um, this has been discussed uh, for many, many years. I think it was probably eight to ten years ago. There was a proposal to improve the streetscape. What does that mean? Well, and more recently than yeah. that, we, pro we had sure. a proposal come to us mm -hmm. um, when, when I was mayor. So yeah, uh, and, and not only yeah. yeah, and not only that, but Gail felt that this was very important as they were doing their study of the downtown. That this was important that we improve the streetscape for. For various reasons, one is shade, uh, which is critical to the success of the street that we make sure we have shade. But also, um, uh, we want to look at could we provide more cafe type seating? Um, is that reasonable? And is that worth a trade off on parking? Because oftentimes that means that you would have less parking spaces available, but more outdoor cafe seating um, and manage uh, that differently. So. You know, this is discussions we're going to have. The reason I want to bring it forward is because we start looking at the time frames. If this project is viable and if we move forward with this project, we need to be under construction by summer because we don't want to do this type of construction during season. Right. Um, some of the constraints that we've placed on this project are that we don't want a lot of disruption. We want to keep businesses open. We want to keep traffic, a certain amount of traffic open during the construction. So that's a constraint. And we also want to do it at a reasonable cost, as well as um, you know, not uh, disturb a lot of the utilities and whatever, because then it becomes a lot, a very complicated project. So we're looking at doing it without disturbing drainage and other utility services. Yeah. So, so when we get to the point of having the actual design, we'll bring it back to the commission. That's correct, and we anticipate sometime in um, January. So, Michelle, I just want to encourage. I know I don't have to say this because I know you'll do it, mm -hmm. but I want to encourage the conversation with the restaurant owners. I, I'm sure if their bottom lines increase because they have cafe seating that's worth giving up the, the parking. And if there's literally no parking on Clematis, it really just forces everybody to find different locations, which isn't a bad thing, but um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, fear, fear of change. <laughs> this is very we started those conversations yeah. with yeah. them. And uh, it, how's, it, how's it going? It's better than we thought, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, were, they have been mm -hmm. more accept, uh, accepting. Well, and we're developing a, a we're going to develop a outreach program. Um, you know, I thought the outreach program on the mobility plan was well received and we're doing something very similar here. And um, also, you know, we just had some very brief preliminary conversations with some of the merchants, you know, just to, you know, kind of feel it out. And it seems like uh, people, it's been better received uh, than what I imagined, so.